By the time of the New Testament, the ancient city of Babylon that we're hearing so much about in the book of Daniel was long gone. The whole empire that had once existed centered there in the city of Babylon was gone. But the New Testament mentions Babylon several times. But when it does, it's not referring directly to the ancient city of Babylon, again, as we're thinking about here. In 1 Peter 5.13, for instance, Peter says, She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. Babylon? Is Peter writing from Babylon? Well, Peter seems to be writing from a location that he cryptically refers to as Babylon. In fact, we think that he's probably writing from the city of Rome, representing something theologically like a Babylon. When the early church referred to Babylon, again, we see it in the New Testament, we see it afterward in the writings of the church fathers, they're hearkening back to a time when God's people were in exile in a foreign land, in a hostile land. The memory of the exile lived on in the minds of God's people, and it eventually took on fresh meaning for the church. I've titled my message, This is Babylon. Our text is Daniel 3 verses 1 through 30, so the whole of Daniel chapter 3. Daniel here, the author, underscores the pressure that God's people can expect to endure. They will face pressure to be forced into the mold of this world, a world that we know is ultimately not our home. We're always outsiders here. But God's people do not. God's people never struggle alone. God is near and he is mighty to save. Let's read the text together. Daniel 3, beginning in verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 60 cubits or 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the, per, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace." Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall, fow, shall bow down, shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning fiery furnace. Verse 12, there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods, or worship the golden image you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods, or worship the golden image that I have set up? Verse 15, Now, if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, 
our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and the expression of his face changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flames of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? Then answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego servants of the most high God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire and the satraps, the prefects, the governors and the king's counselors gathered together and they saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of these men. The hairs on their head was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their house, houses laid in ruins. For there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king of Babylon, the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. This book is titled Daniel. He's the namesake. He's the author. But he doesn't appear anywhere in this episode. Did you notice that? He's totally absent. He's actually probably away serving somewhere. And we'll talk more about that later. Verse, uh, chapter 2 verse 49 gives a hint about where he probably is. But remember this book is not a biography of Daniel. It is a theological declaration that Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, is the sovereign God and ruler of history. This is not merely some sort of biographical reflection on Daniel or autobiography. There are four main movements in this message that will carry it, beginning with number one, the king fashioned a God. These events seem to be set relatively near to where we left off at the end of chapter 2. So probably not a lot of time has passed. You'll recall that Daniel, even if you weren't here with us, it's a familiar story. Daniel interpreted the king's dream, which foretold of these successive kingdoms. He had dreamed, he saw a statue, and each part represented these four successive kingdoms that would come. Three after the kingdom of Babylon. In part, what Nebuchadnezzar seems to be doing here is a test of loyalty. But what he's doing is probably inspired by what we saw in chapter 2. This dream that he had, again, of this great statue. Perhaps there's also an outworking here of Nebuchadnezzar's pride. Again, think about that statue. In the hope of overturning or keeping back the events which his dream had predicted... He was determined to see that his kingdom, although God had, through Daniel, predicted that these other kingdoms would follow, he would perhaps say that my kingdom will not fall. I will not give way to successive rulers. His reign, his kingdom would endure forever. So there's this great boasting, perhaps, this great compensation coming from the king here. His reign, his kingdom would endure. He wanted to declare to his empire. 
If the golden head of that statue from chapter 2 represented him and his kingdom, he would make a statue covered completely in gold. Nebuchadnezzar built a statue and commands worship of it. That seems strange to us as modern people in the West. But understand that the ancient people, they did not believe that the image was a God itself. They didn't believe that you could make a God in that way. But it would represent a God. It would represent an item of worship. And thus it would be warranted that you could worship the God by worshiping that image. Of course, in Jewish theology and the theology of the Bible, that would never suffice. I naturally think about Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 22. The way that Paul explains in our depraved state that we make idols for ourselves. Uh, the, the text says, the apostle says, they exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and animals. Now, again, lest you be tempted to say to yourself, wow, it's a, it's a good thing. That stuff sounds so weird. It's a good thing we don't really deal with that today in, in our context. We're more, we're more advanced than that. But we're not as different from the ancients as we often think. We find many creative ways for idolatry in our own society. As John Calvin said, our hearts are idol factories. One important theologian from the 20th century, I won't even mention his name. You wouldn't know who he was, perhaps. And he's usually not someone I would quote. But he, he describes the way in which we, although we don't have idols in the same way that perhaps the ancients would or other parts of the world might, he says that, that a person's God is, is that thing that that person is most concerned with. That thing which draws its affections. Whatever we think about the most, whatever consumes our life very easily, very quickly becomes an idol. The point is, is that idolatry is much broader than we often admit. I can bring it even closer to home, though. Again, you say, okay, yeah, but that's still, that's a little more abstract. That's a little different. Uh, no, not, not quite. Uh, this Wednesday, I guess it's April 25th. Yeah, it's this Wednesday. An Episcopalian church in San Francisco, just, just right up the way, just right up 280, right? Grace Cathedral is the name of the church. Uh, they are dedicating a worship service to Beyonce Knowles, the pop singer. It's not a joke. They're calling it a Beyonce Mass. The, the whole worship service will be geared toward focusing their minds and hearts uh, on her. They'll be singing her songs via the worship. And they'll be reflecting on and promoting the idea of black feminine spirituality. And thus focusing their worship service around that. Uh, you can't make this stuff up. This stuff's quite close to home. We are not as different from the ancients as we often think. Even a church that would profess to be a Protestant church. So Nebuchadnezzar built an idol, but God was using these events. Nebuchadnezzar thinks that he is the one in control, as has already happened. But God is using these events to demonstrate his power. God used a pagan king to bring glory to himself. The faith of these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's, these are their Babylonian names, the faith of these men will honor the God of heaven and teach us something powerful. That his mighty power to save them would compel the king to declare God's glory and declare God's power and his superiority over all of the so-called gods of this world, which is what we see at the conclusion of the chapter. The leading officials in Babylon came to this dedication. We see that in verse 2 and 3. It's very repetitive, isn't it? It seems redundant, repeating all of these various things. Uh, um, Hebrew, and actually this becomes Aramaic, is just a redundant language, but I, I want to read them all the way it is in the text there. But the whole idea is that these are all of the leaders, all of the foremost leaders in the empire of Babylon have come in for this. The statue's not in the capital city itself. It was, it's what's called in the plain of Dura. It's probably a few miles outside the city. In fact, uh, archaeologists have found a spot 16 miles outside the ancient city of Babylon, which has a large thing that might have been the very base of this statue. This, this likely explains again why Daniel is probably not there. He's back in the city of Babylon in the king's palace, as we see in verse 29, or 49 of chapter 2. And so he's not there. The king declared that 
that whoever disobeyed this order would be consumed in a furnace. In verse 6, again, no one doubted that the king would actually follow through with what he said. The king was known, and not just Nebuchadnezzar, this isn't just picking on him, but ancient kings were known for their brutality and their paranoia of loyalty and obedience. They might be powerful, but there was always someone vying to take over, as what's always the story of empires. Stephen Miller, a commentator, says this, Nebuchadnezzar probably chose this means of punishment, not only because it was horrifying as a way to die, but because it was convenient. This furnace would have been available for smelting metal. The ancient people, like the Babylonians, were, were very good at using metal. And remember, the king had just built this golden statue, which would, would have required excessive amount of gold work. It, the statue would not have been um, solid gold. It would have been plated or covered in gold. Still, quite a feat, something like 90 feet high, massive statue. These ancient furnaces, this is not like a little fireplace, they would heat up to 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot. Stephen Miller, a commentator, says, one can only imagine the fear that engulfed the crowd as the flames leaped from the top of the furnace and the smoke billowed forth. You could just assume that while they're even there, they could smell that furnace burning. They could perhaps see the flames shooting up in the distance. To create something that's 1,800 degrees, that takes a lot of fire. Virtually all the people bow down in verse 7. The king seems initially satisfied at the outcome as he's watching loyalty. From what he could see, and again, this is a large crowd, from what he could see, it seemed that everyone had bowed down. And so he's, he's patting himself on the back, a job well done. My kingdom is firmly in my hand. For most of the people, this would have fit their religious worldview just fine. No problem. King, sure, you set up a statue. Sure, of course we'll worship it. You're the king. Uh, our gods protect us. And obviously our gods are powerful because look how powerful we are. So, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll worship your, your, your image, your statue. They're polytheistic. They're accustomed to worshiping many gods. But the Hebrews could not. Only three men refused this order. Just think about it. They stood isolated and alone. We can so build this up because it's a familiar story to us. We forget three men in the whole crowd of people refused the order. What kind of bravery would that take? What sort of bravado would that take? They stood isolated. I mean, you can, can you imagine the pressure they felt at that moment? Maybe we could just sort of go down part way. Maybe, we don't, maybe they won't notice if we lean in just a little bit. And as the text says, certain Chaldeans, or, or some will say astrologers, it's speaking of an ethnic class of people that were known for their astrology and their, their magic of serving the king. They see this as their opportunity. And that leads us to number two. The king's men accused three Hebrews. Again, we know these names well. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They could have gotten away with it. In fact, it, it seems that they almost went unnoticed initially. The king doesn't notice. And again, he was probably scanning and looking, but there were sufficient people that he hadn't noticed. We can only imagine the sense of relief maybe that they felt like, oh, guys, we did the right thing. We didn't bow and, and nobody noticed. By God's grace, thank you, Lord. We were faithful and, and, and they, didn't, they didn't notice. All is well. Perhaps they comforted themselves at that moment. They would be able to go home to their families. Most people didn't notice, but these astrologers, these Chaldeans, see this as an opportunity. You know what? As, as Christians, you can expect that there will be people just looking for an opportunity to accuse you. Don't be surprised. Don't, honestly, don't take it personally. There will always be people looking, just waiting for you to mess up. The same was true for Jesus. Was it not? His whole ministry, people were just looking for any opportunity to trick him in his language, to watch him doing something on the Sabbath he shouldn't have. And that eventually leads to his death on the cross. He said, if they did so to me, they will do so to you. Let's just be prepared for it. Let's just recognize that. As, as Americans, we become so com comfortable in, in what we think is our freedom that, that we kind of um, are, are so taken aback when we think that anyone could, could accuse us in such a way. Uh, they accuse the, the three Hebrews before the king. They go directly to him. You can almost picture them running to the king. 
at the root of their malicious accusations seems to be two things. Uh, number one, professional jealousy. And the other one, probably prejudice. At the end of chapter 2, we saw that, that the king promoted Daniel to a high position. And Daniel did not forget his three friends who had interceded with him and re when God revealed the dream. And so he, he was able to put his three friends, his, his uh, fellow countrymen, into these positions of influence. Remember, the Jews were foreigners in Babylon. They did not fit in. What were they doing in such a place of influence? You could see the others point to them and think, what are these Jews doing here, these Judeans whom we conquer, these weak people and their, and their one God? What are they doing here? So these Chaldeans probably feel passed over for promotion, and so resentment sets in. So often comes out of our hearts as sinners. And the fact that they were Jews made it even worse. Prejudice is not new to the modern era. It, it infected the ancient world as well. It just finds different manifestations. In our sinful nature, we, we find ways to classify people, us versus them, in all kinds of created ways. Sometimes it's, it's class, social class. It's, it's those people and me, whether it's up or down. Sometimes it's ethnicity, as, as would have been true here. Sometimes it's religious affiliation, whatever it is. In our society, it has most often been, and the most painful division has been an artificial category called race. Rather than seeing the beautiful mosaic of God's special creation, that all people, whatever color, whatever ethnic background, are all created in the image of God, we have in our society so often divided people by color. These people are that color. These people are that color. And we're, we're just different. This is sin, plain and simple. Remember, we all come from the same family. You must realize that. If Adam and Eve had a family reunion, all of y'all would be there. Everybody. Christians before and beyond anyone else should get this and should live this. And the world should look to us as seeing, wow, they see something that we missed. And yet so, I've, so often, sadly, Christians have simply gone along with the world in that way. In verse 12, part of the reason that I'm, I'm pointing out this, this point of prejudice is in verse 12, they, they make sure to note that these rebels are Jews. By the way, these Jews... That you set up, hey king, hey, with all due respect, we, we know that you set them up. I don't know if you made the right choice setting up these Jews. They don't respect you, O king. The king flew into a furious rage. And this leads to number three. A king's fury is to be feared. You know, the Bible has much to say about civil authority and how we are to think about government. Here, for instance, the reverent fear that is rightly due to rulers. Think about the Proverbs that have many things to say about this. I'll name just two. Proverbs 16 verse 14 says, A king's wrath is a messenger of death, and a wise man will appease it. Proverbs 20 verse 2, The terror of a king is like a growling of a lion. Whoever provokes him uh, to anger forfeits his life. We, we rightly fear those who are in power. I mean, really, could, could we blame these three guys if they would have bowed? Could we really blame them? I mean, we can understand why they would fear the king, especially this king, honestly. We have good reason to revere the authorities that God has placed over us. Think about Romans chapter 13, verse 4. When the Apostle Paul says about the civil authorities, he says, for he personified, think about he as government, for, for the government is God's ser servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. But Daniel, but Daniel declares that there is one, and this is just the whole core of the book, the whole background, the whole central theme. Daniel declares that there is one who stands above all the rulers of this world. And he reigns from heaven as the one and only holy righteous judge of the earth. Not only the book of Daniel, could we not say that is the, the message of the Bible, that there is one God who rules sovereignly? 
James Montgomery Boyce, a commentator, he comments on this as he's reflecting on this point. He says, the fact that God raises up rulers does not make rulers autonomous. It does not give them unlimited power. The duty of believers, that's us, is to remind the state of this divine limitation. They, that would be we, are to do so by words and if necessary by laying down our very lives. You have to see that the actions of these three Hebrews is what we would call civil disobedience. The state says this and they say no. As Christians, we rightly revere and respect the authorities that God has put over us. We seek to be good citizens. But there is a time when Christians must challenge and resist the state. Just this last week, there is a bill that has gone through the California General Assembly that should cause all of us to go fall on our knees in prayer. It's Assembly Bill 2943, which without really, without any of us really knowing what's going on, unless you're really in the know in Sacramento, this bill has come through. Again, it's, it's, a, uh, it's Assembly Bill 2943. And the idea of this bill is this. Well, first of all, it, it passed through the, the House in flying colors, 50 to 18, without really much of a debate at all, and is now set and poised to go before the Senate, which it assumed to be passed, and then will go to be signed by the governor. This bill... It's actually quite, it's quite crafty. It is a backdoor way. It is not a criminal bill, but it is a bill that it, it's, it's an anti-fraud bill, which is a backhanded way to say that anyone who would promote a, what, what we would understand very clearly as the orthodox, historic, biblical understanding of sexuality and gender if anyone who would promote that, whether by conferences, whether by books, whether by speaking, perhaps even like I'm doing right now, anyone who would work as a counselor to promote that or try to help someone in that lifestyle through ministry would be susceptible to fraud and thus to lawsuit. And so a conference that sought to minister to and help those who are in the LGBT community and want help and want to follow God in obedience, that would be illegal. A book that would define just very simply the understanding of marriage between a man and a woman and his gender as something that is good and created by God, that book would become contraband. You all know that, if you know me at all, I'm not a doomsdayer. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't read the National Enquirer. But this is, this is serious. And it's not just potential. It looks like it's going to be passed this week and signed by Jerry Brown this week. It doesn't look like we're really going to have any hope of, of, of overturning it or, or of, of stopping it rather. But it's an understanding of this is what is going to be reality now. Last year it was Christian education. Now at risk is ministry. And to understand what, we under, what, it, what the Bible defines as good and holy in gender and sexuality. You are going to be tempted to bow before the state on this issue. Some of you, because of the nature of your job, are going to be pressed especially hard. If you're a public school teacher, uh, bless you, thank you, but you are going to be pressed really hard on this issue. But lest you think, it's, it's so tempting for us to think that, oh goodness, is, is there any way we could just give in on this one issue? Sexuality and gender, it's, it's, not, it's not at the core of the gospel. Maybe we could sort of just, just give in. Lest you think that if you give in on this, uh, that, that, that they will sort of let things be. It'll, it'll never happen. There will always be more. We live in a land that stands poised against the kingdom of God. We feel it, especially in California, especially this week. Stand firm in the faith. Resist the pressure to give in. And go to your knees in prayer to the God of all grace. When the laws of a land transgress the law of God, we must resist. It's quite simple. We have good reason to fear the government authorities as as ordained and set up by God, we have good reason to respect them, but we must fear God more than man. We are citizens of heaven before we are citizens of earth. 
after the king's anger subsided, he gave the Hebrews the benefit of the doubt. It seems, honestly, he's trying to be gracious. Verse 14, and, and you could sense that he would say, guys, hey, look, I'm not an unreasonable man. Look at, look at how gracious I am. Come, come on in here, guys. I, I, I was angry, but, you know, come on in here, guys. He says, was it true that you refused to worship the statue? This was their one and only chance to rethink. How would they respond? Perhaps the king had grown fond of these men. I mean, like any ruler, he doesn't want to dispose unnecessarily of helpful administrators in his kingdom, especially after investing them. Remember, he had put them through a rigorous schooling for three years, and fed them and, and set them up and instructed them. He gave them another chance to obey the order. I mean, how, how generous of the king. Think of verse 15. But unlike the peoples of this world, God's people worship only Yahweh, only the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We might be inclined to ask how Nebuchadnezzar could possibly resort to this kind of offense against God after everything that happened back in chapter 2. Again, it was two weeks ago for us now. He saw the power of God through Daniel being able to not only tell him his dream, but interpret it and all the things that happened there that none of his other magicians and astrologers and so on could do. But understand that in his polytheistic worldview, uh, much like ours, a, a view of pluralism, that we can sort of, sort of think about religion like a salad bar. You kind of pick and choose what you want and leave what you don't want. He might gladly add the God of, of Daniel. He might gladly add the God of the Hebrews to his deities to honor. But that wouldn't prevent him from worshiping other idols, right? That's his own worldview. It's not, again, not all that different from many who would be in your society today. That we would have as neighbors, friends, co-workers. But the king will eventually learn the error of his ways. When the God of heaven will humble him much further. Until he recognizes that the God of heaven is the only sovereign one. He asks who could, who could possibly rescue them from the king's hand. This king is so sovereign. He is so powerful. He's defeated all the kings of the earth. Not even the gods could stop him he feels like. Temper Longman, a commentator, says, the king climaxes his exhortation with a statement that gets at the heart of the theological teaching of this chapter. What God is able to rescue you from my hand? I mean, in pride, obviously the king is, is implicitly saying, no one, no one will be able to save them. I can't think, I can't help but think of Psalm chapter 2. I would encourage you perhaps even read that devotionally this week. Psalm chapter 2, the whole of it, when there are many forces coming against God and shaking their hands at God, and it says God laughs at his enemies. But if we imagine for a moment, um, they could have tried, thinking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they could have tried to rationalize why they should go along with the king's command. We are so creative in rationalizing things in our minds. They could maybe have tried to rationalize or someone would try to persuade them. Look, the three of you are good men. We need good men in the kingdom. I mean, if you give in and the king kills you, you know, you've lost all influence. Just, ah, just hang in there. Just hush your conscience a little bit. We need guys like you in Babylon. Maybe others would have sought to persuade them by pointing obedience to the state. Hey, look, the king says it. We must obey. That's all there is to it. Plain and simple. We must obey the government. Someone might say, look, hey, the king would be content if you, if you just bowed a little bit. You don't, you don't have to worship in your heart. You don't have to do it all the way. All the way. And, you know, hey, what are idols anyway? We know there's only one God. Just, just give in. Tip your head slightly. The temptation would have been so strong. If they wanted to advance in Babylon, they needed to go along with the flow. Accept your context for what it is. Go along with the flow. They could have persuaded themselves. They should think about not just their careers, but their families. What's going to happen to their wives and children, assuming that they have families? We could even imagine them being tempted to forget God. Hadn't they already seen that the gods of Babylon are superior in culture, in military? Everything they'd seen in Babylon was meant to awe them. Perhaps the God of Israel had forgotten them. But is that their response? No, we see no hesitation at all. 
They stood firm in the truth. We will not bow, they said. They remembered the word of God as in Exodus 20, verses 3 through 6, which condemned all forms of idolatry. They stood firmly on the word of God. The reply is not arrogant, it's not proud, but it is firm. They, they had no need to deliberate. Their, their minds were made up. Look at verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image you have set up. They didn't budge. What incredible faith. I mean, they stood before the most powerful man on earth and said, you asked us who could possibly rescue us? Our God can rescue us. Um, James Montgomery Boyce says, and I love the way that he words it, this is faith in the furnace. It is a firm conviction of the sovereignty of God in the midst of all things contrary. When all things seem to be stacked against you, when all the odds seem to be so long, they said, no, our faith is in God. Again, their convictions were based in the teachings of the law, the early books of the Old Testament. You understand here how biblical fidelity is essential to faithfulness. We don't determine what is faithful and what is not by kind of weighing the, the, the give and take or the advantages versus the disadvantages. It doesn't work that way. We don't weigh a matter of, okay, what seems to be helpful and reasonable for us. No, it comes to knowing the word of God, loving and, and, and being set in the word of God and saying, I will obey, come what may. Not only did they know the commandments of God, again, which strictly prohibited idolatry, they would have known the mighty miracles of God that he had worked before Israel. They knew about the plagues of Egypt. They knew about the parting of the Red Sea. They knew the mighty way that God had brought them into the promised land and given them a land that was not theirs. Stephen Miller says, no question could have existed in their minds that the God who divided the sea and performed other miracles in delivering Israel from Egypt could do the same for them if it was within his will. You think about this. I mean, is there a hint here about the doctrine of resurrection? I mean, they could say, even if God doesn't save us at this moment, we know that he holds the life that is to come in his hands. We're actually going to encounter the doctrine of uh, uh, resurrection, rather. We're going to encounter resurrection in pretty clear terms when we get to chapter 12, the very end of Daniel. In fact, it's the clearest understanding, the clearest expression of the doctrine of, re of resurrection in the whole of the Old Testament. Uh, they said, we know God is able to save us. But even if he chooses not to, according to his sovereign will, we will still trust him. It's easy to trust God when we think that he's doing what we want for us. But they said, even if he does not, I will trust him. They know that God is able to save him, but they're also willing to die as martyrs. It's not a, a term we usually think of in the Old Testament, but this is martyrdom. No different from what we see in the New Testament and in the early church. There is a long history of martyrdom in our church history, in our family history. In some parts of the world, you realize Christians have to think about that history every single day. It is a reality that they face, that they might be killed for their faith. At the very least, they might be imprisoned for their faith. But it is not unforeseeable that we might face true persecution in our own land as well, even as I've outlined a moment ago. Persecution is not when people sneer at you. That's not persecution. Persecution is not when people laugh at you because of your faith. That's just an inconvenience. Persecution. I'm talking about serious consequences for standing up for your faith. It might be in our own lifetimes, as fast as things are going, that we could face that even here. What will we do? What will you do? Timber Longman says, no matter the result... Deliverance or death, they will not give into the evil powers of this world. They will stay faithful to God. 
The king was livid. I mean, verse 19, in, in the original language, I mean, it's just, he is just, you know, just snarling in anger. He said, in effect, heat that furnace as hot as possible. It, it's a proverbial expression when he says seven times hotter. That's an expression. I mean, you get that thing as hot as it'll go. Indeed, they did. They heated it to maximum intensity. It was so hot that the men, and these are not little guys, it says mighty um, soldiers that take them up and throwing them in, they are consumed by the heat and they are killed. That's how hot it was. All it would take is a change in the wind or, or enough flames shooting up and it killed them. They fell headlong into the furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <coughs> Uh, the text in verse 23, it suggests that they went in through an opening at the top of the furnace. Uh, the, the furnace must have had an opening at the top and an opening at the side. The furnace might have been built into the side of a hill. Uh, and, then, and so thus they could have walked up and thrown them in the top. And then there was a side that was exposed. So the king would have been able to see what was going on in there. We, we, through archaeology, there's many different types. And this is probably the type of furnace that, we're, that I'm expressing here. It would make sense of the text. In chapter 2, God had revealed his great wisdom and knowledge. That was the point. God is the one who knows the mysteries and reveals mysteries. But here, he will reveal his great power. Number four, the king confessed the supreme power of God. Nebuchadnezzar was not prepared for what, we, for what he saw. I mean, he could not believe his eyes. He, I don't think that he would have wore glasses, but he you know, sort of takes off. Am I seeing what, what I think I'm seeing? Am I having another vision or something? What, what, what in the world am, is going on? He had every reason to expect that he would watch them perish in flames almost just instantaneously. Again, it was so hot it killed the men trying to put them in. And yet he sees them in there, unbound. He jumps to his feet in verse 24. He saw them walking around in the furnace unharmed. And then not only that, he sees a fourth figure, a fourth man in there. And he asks, he says, there were three that we put in there, right? He said, yes, yes, O king. I don't know what's going on. And how does he describe the fourth man in verse 25? He says, the fourth man looked like a son of the gods. The NRSV, popular translation, translates that same expression, trying to make sense of this. It says, um, saw one that had the appearance of a god, small g. The King James, if any of you still have the old King James, you'll notice that it actually gets more direct to say, uh, like the Son of God, even in caps. Both of these get at the point that Nebuchadnezzar himself, now Nebuchadnezzar is a pagan king, Right? He's not a Christian. He's not a Jewish theologian. But from his perspective, as he looks, it makes the point that he thought this fourth figure was divine. That, that's not a man. It complicates things in verse 28 when he calls the figure an angel. Okay, so it is, is it an angel or, or is it a god or, or what do we do with that? Some have identified this fourth figure as a pre-incarnate Christ. And perhaps so. The point in the, is not ultimately clear in the text, but what is clear is that God handled the situation. Clement, an ancient Christian who's writing, actually almost overlapping the very end of the Old Testament and into the period right after, or not Old Testament, New Testament, excuse me, and right into the early church period after the time of the New Testament. He reflects on this and he says that the point is the most high is the defender and protector of those who serve his excellent name with a pure conscience. What we know unequivocally is that God sustained them. Look at the way verse 27 expresses it. Verse 27, And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair on their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. And the smell of fire had not come upon them. I mean, it was as if the fire, it was as if they hadn't even been near the furnace. They don't even smell like smoke. The soldiers lay dead at the top. But these men were left untouched. Nebuchadnezzar was stunned. And rightfully so. What he witnessed was a bona fide miracle. 
He, he had set up himself as the supreme power of the earth. That's what he had in his heart. Even the gods could not overpower his will was his point. No one can rescue. He so arrogantly declared. But one commentator says, Through this miracle and others recorded in this book, Yahweh made it clear to Nebuchadnezzar, who blatantly challenged God's power, and to all the world that Judah's defeat, why they had gone off into exile, that Judah's defeat was not because God did not exist or because he was anemic. It would have been hard for the pagans to get beyond that. Well, they, they failed. They're here in exile because we're greater. We are greater than their God. Perhaps the Jews would even have feared in their hearts that God had forsaken them again. That's not why they were in exile. They were in exile because God had sent them there. The king was compelled to acknowledge that Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he was the sovereign one. Think of the text in Deuteronomy 32, verse 39, when God declares, See now that I, even I, am he. There is no God besides me, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. Our God holds all power. And he declares to his people that he is mighty to save. Church, trust him. Stand firmly in the faith. Rest in him. Obey him and let him handle the rest. Come what may. That puts us in a better position than trying to say that we're going to try to make our own way, which will always give ground, which will always lead to dishonoring God and ultimately lead to our own destruction. We must trust in him. In a twist of irony, I mean, this is truly irony, but the king praised them for their faith in God, right? The one who just tried to kill them for that faith is now praising them for that same faith. See, that's not rational. The power that the state thinks it has is not rational. I mean, he, he praised their boldness because, what does he say in the text? He says, that because they set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own. So he's praising them for breaking his law. The king declared that no one in his empire will be allowed to do what he himself had just so foolishly done in verse 29. He says, if anybody speaks bad of their god, I'm, I'm going to take care of them. He's like, king, you were just speaking badly about, about their god. He has a total shift there. That such a command emanated from the lips of a heathen pagan king is, is just astounding. But consider the circumstances and it makes more sense. Nebuchadnezzar had just witnessed a miracle, a profound miracle. His decree might have been an attempt here to appease the God of Israel. Oh, oh yeah, actually, hey, God of Israel, I didn't mean what I was saying about that whole nobody can take them out of my hand and I'm the sovereign one. I, I didn't mean any of that. Remember, he had just mistreated Yahweh's followers. He had challenged God's power. And so perhaps the king feared reprisal on God's part. That makes more sense out of his declaration. At the end of chapter 2, again two Sundays ago, I wondered aloud, so is Nebuchadnezzar converted at this moment? Well, again, second time now, it seems not. James Montgomery Boyce says, he was going to have to sink much lower before he was ready to acknowledge that there is but one God and worship him alone. We're getting there soon as we continue through Daniel. Now, regardless of how we interpret the fourth figure in the furnace, and again, I told you from the text, it's, it's, it's not totally clear. Regardless of how we interpret that, there is much for us to reflect on regarding Christ. Jesus is our Emmanuel. He is our God with us. He came to earth to fulfill his mission to redeem a people. To accomplish this, he would lay down his life for us in faithfulness to the Father and in love for his sheep. So when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they stood up to Nebuchadnezzar and they were sent into the fiery furnace, what do we see there? God reached in graciously, mightily, and he protected them. He miraculously spared them. But not so with Jesus. The Father did not spare his one and only Son when he went to the cross. He could have, if it were his will, he could have. 
but he did not spare his one and only son. Ian Duguid, a commentator, reflects on this very point. And he says, there was no companion to share his burden, thinking of Jesus. No angel sent to relieve his agony. No saving hand from God stretched down to preserve his faithful servant in the moment of his greatest need. For Jesus, there was no deliverance from experiencing the power of the final enemy, death itself. Jesus took the punishment. He took the punishment which was due to us and he drank it whole. He paid our debt. In this world, you will face trouble. But take heart. Christ has overcome the world. You will face pressure to conform. You will face pressure this week. But our God is mighty to save. Stand firm in your faith. Look to Christ as the Savior. Hold fast. Stand firm. Christ is the risen Lord. Let's pray.